Good morning and welcome. I'm glad you guys are all here. Glad for those that are tuning in online. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, thank you, shout out to uh, everyone who was a part of the breakfast yesterday. Thank you for those that helped put light in dark places. Whether you came and helped serve, uh, gave up your time and resources and skills, or uh, you helped by coming and donate and uh, sponsor couples for uh, marriage, or you just came and ate with us and fellowshiped, and that was really awesome too. So that was that was a really cool thing, and I can't talk about enough uh, how good uh, marriage really is, and like how marriage retreats can be super super beneficial. I know for uh, me and Lauren in our lives, uh, we've been to a few, and they've been just really really good blessings. So if you're kind of at a place where you're kind of riding the fence here. You've been talking about it or thinking about it. Um, I just ask that you uh, make that jump. There's so many reasons why not to. Uh, those are easy to come by. But uh, really want to encourage you guys to press into that. Uh, I know, like I said, uh, Lauren and I have benefited from a few. There's always like little gold nuggets of wisdom, I feel like, that you can take home with your spouse, and I'll just share one with you that uh, me and Lauren recently kind of fired back up, and that's um, praying with each other before bed. Uh, husbands, pray with your wives before bed. Wives, pray with your husbands before bed. It's, it's, a, it's just one of those things that's a great kind of conclusion to the day. It's re-centering you guys as life can get crazy, and you can do spiritual life, have your own spiritual time, or, you know, study time, and that kind of just brings it all together and uh, also hold you accountable if you're kind of in a point where maybe you're not feeling like praying for the other because maybe something happened or you're upset. It does. It keeps you accountable. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and um, pray with your wife. Pray with your spouse. Um, but as I'm talking about prayer and we're going into that, we're kind of uh, ending our uh, prayer series, and I thought amen was an appropriate word as it's kind of a conclusion to our prayers uh, a lot of the times. We say amen at the end, and as you heard uh, Ben Lu say, amen actually means so be it. It doesn't almost feel like it's not necessarily that period at the end of a sentence, but more so just handing it back over to God and saying, all right, God, your will be done. So um, as we dive into this last uh, day of prayer, I, I had a lot of different things that I kind of wanted to address and talk about um, within prayer because there's so much more, I feel like. Uh, and one of those things is praise and thanksgiving. I feel like it's so beneficial uh, to start our day by thanking the Lord and praising Him. And same thing with our prayers that way. And uh, Psalm 104 says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts of praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. That's one that we threw on the board this week, and our little boys are memorizing because I just think it's that important. I was like, yes, this is what we're going to be talking about. And then I kind of felt it going a different direction. And I wanted to kind of hit on the persistence of prayer and how it's important to continually to be persistent in prayer. Uh, there's the story Jesus tells about the persistent widow that keeps coming back and back to this unjust God uh, and just is very persistent to where the unjust, sorry, judge, not God, unjust judge finally is just like, all right, away from you, woman. I, I grant whatever you want kind of thing because he's just done with it. And uh, within that message is how much more would a loving God uh, treat us and answer us if we just continually come to him in prayer. First Thessalonians five sixteen through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Those are two really short verses, by the way, if you want to memorize two quick ones. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. What a good uh, two verses to kind of walk by. And uh, but honestly, as I was kind of going through the Lord's Prayer, I knew something else jumped out at me, and it was forgiveness, the idea of forgiveness. And I think this is kind of one of those topics that help us in our prayer life, but can also uh, stunt our 
prayer life as well. If, if we're holding on to anger, if we're holding on to bitterness, if we're holding on to things, um, it might prevent us from walking in that spiritual power that we've kind of been talking about and creating, you know, week one, week two, week three, as we're talking about walking in, in God's power through prayer and, and engaging him and connecting with him so much. I feel like this is one thing that our enemy might try to hold against us to keep us holding on to some bitterness. So Luke 17, 1. Uh, we'll go ahead and go into Luke chapter 17, verse 1. And to kind of set this up, uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples here. He's letting them know that the world is going to hurt you. Uh, the world is going to betray you. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. We will stumble. People will hurt you. People will betray you. People will let you down. In verse 3, Jesus continues, So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And this rebuke is more of like confront them, deal with the issue. As you see there, it says brothers, if your brother or sister sins against you. He's talking about a fellow believer. So hopefully we can go to that person and realize that we can reconcile this relationship. We want healing in this relationship. So we want to do that. That's the rebuke, right? So uh, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. But then, then Jesus says something kind of crazy in verse 4. That's a little bit different. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And now this is more of a realistic scenario with my kids and my children as they're fighting and bickering and I'm telling them, you know, hey, you hit your brother, say sorry, right? And that, that kind of scenario can happen seven times a day. But as I think of like maybe us as an adult, if someone were to truly hurt you or, or me, you know, once or twice, and then they do it, you know, again, it, it would be like, come on, man, like, what, what are you trying to do here? Um, as the uh, Michael Scott quote uh, always comes to me, you know what they say, fool me once, strike one, fool me twice, strike three. And that's kind of how it feels in a way of like, uh -uh, we're not going to keep going uh, with all these strikes. But that, that's not what Jesus tells us to do. He tells us to, if they come back and they repent, we are to forgive. And the disciples' response to this in verse 5 is this. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They're basically saying, Jesus, this is crazy. This is hard. What are you talking about? Like, if you're going to expect us to forgive this many times, increase our faith. Lord, help us with this. And so as we kind of get to that point in Scripture, I want to kind of pause and I want us to pray and just ask God to increase our faith at this time. Will you pray with me? Father God, right now as we're all here, uh, we all come in from different walks of life and different things that have happened to us. And Lord, as we kind of dissect and talk about forgiveness, uh, this can be a hard topic. So I ask, Lord, um, that with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you just give him power to help us increase our faith at this time. Lord, increase our faith. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Amen. So, who lets you down? Who betrayed you? Who lied to you? Who mistreated you? Who abused you? Who let you down? Who hurts you? It's relatively easier to let go of something when it's only one time or maybe something really small. 
it's not so easy if it's something that happens over and over or it was something really big and very, very painful. Who betrayed you? Was it something way back in your childhood? Maybe you were bullied and um, those words, they hurt, they cut deep. Maybe it was words over and over and still to this day, you might have a challenge at looking at yourself differently because of those words and because of what they said, and you're still carrying the, that hurt, the pain, and it cuts you deep. Maybe it's a friend that stole from you. Your time, your resources, and they owe you, and it hurt. Maybe someone who's uh, lying to you or lying about you. Maybe it's a parent that you just always wanted to be loved and accepted by, and you did everything you could, but yet they still just always saw you as small or insignificant. Could be a spouse that you believed in, and they broke that trust. And now your heart's crushed. Maybe it's an authority figure in your life that you look up to, that they were supposed to protect you, and instead they harmed you. They touched you inappropriately. And somehow in their sick, twisted way, they were able to manipulate you to think it was actually your fault. Who hurts you? Do we really need to forgive something like that? Something that significant? When they don't deserve it at all. And if we are supposed to forgive, then how in the world are we supposed to do it? How do we forgive if they're still doing some of these things? Maybe some of these scenarios have hit home, maybe not. There's plenty more out there. But I do know, and I could probably say this, all of us have been hurt, betrayed, or left, let down by someone. Because we live in a fallen world. So how do we forgive when we don't feel like forgiving? Some of us may even try to forgive, but it's just like, doesn't go away. It's still there. It's almost like vacuuming. Like, have you ever had that, like, object in front of you when you're vacuuming, and it just, like, doesn't come up? So you sweep over it again in perfect form, and you pull back, and it's still there. And so you, like, switch up the old angle, and you're like, I'll get you now, you know? And it's still there, and you're doing the back and forth, like, I can do all things in Jesus' name, like, you will come up. And then it's still there. I can do the hover technique where it's like, I'm parking this sucker over it for 20 seconds now. I am not losing this battle. But somehow it's still there. What do, what do we do next? At least I know what I do. I reach down, pick it up. I inspect this crazy thing that just will not come up. And what do I do next? Throw it back down and try again. It's like, What? But sometimes we do this in life. We go at it every angle, and some reason it just doesn't seem to go away. We try and try to forgive, but we just can't seem to do it. This message today is going to be painful for some. It's going to be really difficult. But I hope you will all will understand God tells us clearly as followers of Christ that we are ought to forgive. We are to forgive. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 44 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Sounds totally doable so far. Love people who love you. Be mean to people who are mean to you. Jesus doesn't end there. He says, But I tell you, love your enemies. 
and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus doesn't mean, you know, the old Lord, rain down your righteous thunder upon them. That's not the prayer. All right. This is a different kind of prayer. This is praying for them. And I had a mentor actually tell me, like, actually pray blessings on your enemies. You know all the stuff that you want? Uh, a really good marriage, healthy kids, good family, everything just to go really with the blessings you ask God for, man, pray that on your enemies. And that, that will work on your heart as God prepares to work on theirs. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses, verse 32, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Uh, Danielle read uh, Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer, but at the very end I want to reread those verses 14 and 15. It says, For if you forgive others... If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whew. Heavy. So God is telling us clearly, we have to forgive. So, what does that really mean? What does forgiveness really mean? And so, as we kind of inspect this uh, topic of forgiveness. Let's first look at what forgiveness is not, right? Forgiveness is not forgetting. To forgive doesn't necessarily mean just wipe it completely out of your brain. It doesn't mean just sweep everything under the rug. It's not saying it never happened. It's not saying that what they did to you wasn't wrong. Or sinful. It's not saying that you have to be a doormat and just allow abuse to continue. That's not what forgiveness necessarily is. You can actually forgive someone and create healthy bound boundaries. You can forgive someone and say, hey, I want to work on our trust again. It's been hurt. It's been shattered. It's okay to actually talk with someone, and that is kind of this forgiving process, and I want to work our relationship back to where it was. But in other words, forgiveness is not always forgetting. Forgiveness is not fair. There is nothing fair about forgiveness. Uh, it's more fair to want to pay them back Really, you know, and if you're slugged or hit naturally, I think it's in our instincts to want to fight back. Again, I know I reference my children a lot, but I see a lot of the, just the natural tendencies of what is just instilled in us that we have to fight against to, against it. Forgiveness is not fair. You lied to me. You betrayed me. You hurt me. You hurt my child. Justice needs to be served. The pain, the anger might swell up, and it's just not fair. But you want it to be fair. God, I want it to be fair. God, please be fair. But when it actually comes to us, it's interesting. We don't want God to be fair. God is not always fair. God is a just God, but not always fair. Because if God was fair... I would get what my sins deserve, right? If God was fair, I would get what my sins deserve. And in Romans, it clearly lays it out that my sins, the wages of sins, is death. That's hell. God is not a fair God. He is a just God. I love Psalms 103, 10 through 12. It reads, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression for us. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's some good news. He's removed our transgressions from us, our sins. God sent his son to die for us. So forgiveness is not always forgetting. Forgiveness is not fair. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is giving others what God gave us in Christ. We've experienced his grace and his mercy that we didn't deserve. God gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I have hurt others, I have betrayed others, I have stolen, I have cheated, I have fallen short. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. But I have been forgiven. He is my king. He is my savior. And for those that are sitting here and can agree with me on that, we have that relationship with our heavenly father thanks to his grace and his mercy. We have a good, good God, and his mercy endures forever. If there's anyone here that doesn't have that relationship, or you're watching online and you don't have that relationship, and you want that, you can have that. Romans 10, uh, verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. If you have questions about that, or you want to talk to me about that, I'll be right up here after service. I would love to have a conversation with you or answer any questions. Online, ask your questions. Send us messages. This is important. This is why we're here, right? Our relationship with God, it draws us here together as a family. It draws us here to worship and praise his name. So I want everyone to be able to experience that as well. We've experienced mercy from our God and forgiveness because of Jesus. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is giving the very same thing God has given us. That is the power of the gospel. In fact, John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, and sins, sin in Greek is just like this uh, archery term of missing the mark, right? Uh, you have the bullseye, and you miss. It doesn't matter if you miss this, this close or you miss this far. You've, you've missed the mark. But he is faithful and just. And we'll thank you for being a just God, not a fair God, right? And he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The good news is not always about receiving his forgiveness, but extending it to others. Forgiveness doesn't just flow to us. It's supposed to flow through us. That's how he designed it. We read the Lord's Prayer. Again, I'll say a verse from it. And if they pull up uh, on the slides, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You almost read that flow, right? That flow. It's supposed to be as... As God forgives us, we just extend that grace and that mercy and forgiveness to others. So why does God ask us to forgive? We know what it's not. We know what it is. So why? There's many reasons. I want to just cover one main one, and it's because he loves you. He loves you. And in this mindset of forgiving others, you may think that there's healing that takes place with them, but God wants you to focus on the healing in your own heart as well. Because forgiveness allows you to heal as you forgive others. 
Forgiving someone may not set them free, but it always sets you free. Um, as you'll be seeing kind of an odd picture behind me uh, next, you'll notice there's this green-like coconut thing or gourd is typically what is used. Uh, and what they would do to trap a monkey is they would take this gourd, it gets hollowed out, and there's a hole put in it, and usually a, a large substance of food or something that the monkey would want, and they would tie this to a tree or some uh, object that's uh, sturdy, and that's it. That's how you trap a monkey. And it might sound crazy, but this monkey will come by to this trap. It will see whatever is in there and be curious and want to grab in. And once it reaches in and once it grabs it, a trap has been activated. Now, it sounds crazy because what could the monkey just do? Let go. Yeah, it could just let go. But this monkey will hold on from that point on no matter what. It doesn't matter if danger is even approaching. It doesn't matter if its life is at risk. Hunters coming to get the monkey. This monkey will do absolutely everything to save its life. It will flop around. It will jump. It will fight. It will attack. It will do whatever it can to stay alive. But what it won't do is let go. It won't let go. The very thing that is holding it in bondage is its own self. All it has to do is let go. And I can't help but think this is one of those perfect analogies of forgiveness because that's exactly how this works. And maybe some of us today just have not let go. Maybe you're asking the question or you're thinking, but Pastor Nate, you don't know. You don't know what they've done. You don't know what, how am I, how much forgiveness am I supposed to be giving here? And I think we should be asking a different question of how much freedom do you desire? It isn't about extending how much. It's not this quantity thing, right? Jesus kind of killed that when he's like, Dude, forgive seven times a day. Keep going. Just forgive, forgive. It's not about how much forgiveness. It's all about the heart, the healing, and how much freedom you actually desire. I'm going to go ahead and ask the band to come up at this time. It takes faith to forgive. Going back to the first verse that we read with the disciples asking Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. It takes faith to forgive. You see, faith enables us to see past the offense. Faith enables us to see an opportunity for freedom when others will actually see an offense. It takes faith to believe that on the other side of the offense, there's something better than holding a grudge. And so right now, I want to challenge us to just close our eyes wherever we're at. You guys go ahead and close your eyes. And I don't know if it's hurt or pain or everything that I've kind of been talking about up to this point, what you're experiencing. Whether it was something far in the past and it's just a deep wound that you haven't dealt with, you haven't handed over. Man, in, in marriage and cheating and everything that happens in that you have biblical grounds to divorce but I also want to challenge that you also have biblical grounds to forgive. And I know I'm not in those situations or how difficult that can be. And, but that's why I'm saying it says it takes faith to forgive. That takes faith to extend something to someone that they don't deserve. And it's hard to do 
because our flesh kind of fights against it naturally. And that's why we want to ask God, Holy Spirit, please give us more faith. God, increase our faith. So if while I've been talking and while this topic of forgiveness is out there, if there's someone in your heart that just keeps kind of popping up in your head, God's laying this individual on your heart. Maybe you've tried to forgive them. Maybe it's been an ongoing process of doing it. If you want to lay it at the feet of Jesus today, I just want you with your eyes closed, just extend your hands outward and lift your palms and hands upward. Almost in this act of just releasing it and giving it over to God. Lord, increase our faith. Father, help us to lay this at your feet. Sometimes faith activates before our feelings. Our feelings sometimes pull against that, right? Our flesh is, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to do this, but that's why we ask God, Lord, give me more faith to forgive. Increase my faith. I hand this over to you, Father. I don't want to be trapped anymore. I don't want this bondage. There's darkness there. Jesus, you overcame the darkness. You overcome the darkness. And the darkness trembles at your name. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that we can, we can hand over anything to you and lay it at your feet and you will help us. God, we may experience healing from forgiveness like that and it may be a process. Father God, we ask for your help now. Help us forgive. Father, we love you. And it's in your name. All God's people said, amen, and so be it. Let your will be done, Father, not ours. We're going to go into this song, and we're going to sing about the power of Jesus' name and the redemption that we do have. I want to give you guys permission to, if you just need to sit there and listen to these words, do it. If you need to stand there and sing them out and lift your hands, do it. Let's worship our Heavenly Father. Yeah. 
creator from Jesus to have the energy to have the spirit to have the the peace to silence fear and to push darkness away and to forgive so if you would raise your hands may the Lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you may he be gracious to you may his face be towards you and may he give you peace so go forth thank you because his name is alive Your name can I be overcome? Your name is alive, level is high. Your name can I be overcome? Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. 